thank you for coming, first of all. Thank you all for joining me. 105 people registered and it completely blew me away. I couldn't believe that many people um, care and like just want to be involved in the community and just have a, you know, just hear what I have to say. I just was so honored by that. So tonight, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to share a little bit about my story, about my healing journey. It's almost, I feel like I'm getting closer every day. Um, how I feel now after what I've been through, a little bit about what happened while I was healing. So my involvement with Medicaid Normal, my involvement with Veterans of Foreign Wars, Benzo Information Coalition, Intercompass Initiative, and the Withdrawal Project, and then kind of how I transitioned to doing my own thing, which I'm doing coaching and consulting now. Some of you people I recognize um, in the audience. And then I'm going to talk about my current projects. So being human RV, which is my whole van life situation. I live in a van. I travel. I do really fun things. And it's part of my healing journey. Um, some work with psychiatrists recently. Um, outreach for documentary films. I'm in, involved in another film project. Well, two, actually. Um, and some Wounded Warrior stuff. And then some of my future plans about in-person work, workshops. The first one's going to be in Sedona. Some videos, blogs, and groups. So I have a lot to get to, and I really don't like talking. Like, I feel very self-conscious about hearing myself talk, but we're going to do that today, okay? This is going to go up on YouTube later. There's lots of people that couldn't make it, so I, I will send it out recorded tomorrow. It'll be on YouTube um, for people that couldn't catch it. And so what I'm going to try to do is keep it to 30 to 45 minutes, and then I'm going to open the floor so that you all can share some of your experiences, maybe some of what you hear from me me talking about you relate to maybe you have ideas for me maybe there's um you know you live in a city that you want to do an in-person workshop I will happily do that so it's just I just want to be inspiring hopeful um kind of talk about the grassroots level like what I see in my coaching practice now like I've been seeing all these you know very very emotional patterns things that are not being talked about that I wish I had time to write more about. It's just like breaking the stories that I've been hearing, some of the trends that are going on in our mental health system. Um, so I'm gonna talk about that too. So with all that said, let me just look at the audience one last time and I'm gonna share kind of who I see in the audience just so everybody can get an idea. I will try not to call you out like individually. I'll just say in general. All right, I see a lot of survivors. Filmmaker from Medicating Normal, Lynn is here. Um, wait, let me see. Will it show me? Okay, here we go. I see a lot of survivors. I see somebody that runs a program in Vermont. A social worker, students that I went to school with. Hello. The person who, um, I better not say that. A person that was very supportive to me getting through my social work program. Let's say that. Another person who helps me daily just make business decisions and life choices and all that. Okay, a lot of people that are, that I know very closely and dearly that are in protracted withdrawal with me, um, fellow activists, therapists, mothers, and lawyers and friends. And I see some friends. Okay, so there, there you go. That's the audience that we're dealing with. Okay, let me get started. All right. So for those of you that don't know my story, I'm gonna start I'm going to try to make it as brief as possible, but it is kind of long, but I just want to give you a feel of kind of what I went through in the system and how I figured out how to like sort of heal myself as best, best as I can, what that looks like ongoing. And just like some of the trauma that I went through, it was freaking horrific when I sat here writing it and I was like, oh my God, I can't even believe I dealt with this. So let me start in high school. Um, I didn't have the greatest childhood. My parents were pretty rough. I'm a, the oldest of a divorced family. Um, wait, really quick. Can everybody make sure your mic mics are muted? I'm hearing a little bit of sound and I'm not sure. Everybody mute. Dwayne, yeah, might be you. I don't know. Okay. All right. So I didn't have the greatest childhood. So when I was 15, I went through like a re rebellious streak where I was like, I'm doing all these things, but my parents aren't really paying attention to me. And I was feeling kind of depressed. And of course, I went to therapy. Next thing you know, Prozac and Valium at 15 it didn't last very long. I really don't even talk about that very often because it was like six months, but came off pretty quick. I remember feeling like I had mono for like a month and then I fell behind in school and they transferred me from private school to public school and nobody knew what happened to me. You know, I just left school and went to a different school. And so that might be news to some of my schoolmates because it was kind of a secret, you know, back then. 
Um, then I, you know, I was fine. I rebounded pretty quickly. At 18, I joined the army. It was a chance to see the world. It was a chance to earn college money because my family couldn't afford that. Um, and earn it, earned it, I sure did, along with, you know, I probably deserve more than what I was given for, you know, but anyway, I went through hell in the army. When I was about 21, I was stationed in South Korea and I was assaulted by a fellow service member. He was higher ranking than me. Um, I approached my command and told, you know, I was raped. Like, what do I do? The guy's kind of stalking me. I'm really scared. I'm scared to leave my room, you know, that this kind of thing. And basically, uh, my platoon sergeant said, you know, if you report this, they're going to make you like, look like a party girl and you had a couple of drinks and it was your fault. And is that what you want? And I was like, I didn't do anything wrong. Like I just, my keys were stolen now. And later I found out he actually was the one that stole them. And in South Korea, you can't walk on base without a buddy. So he was my buddy to walk me on base. And when I don't have keys, he basically, you know, got me into his room and that's anyway, it was violent. It was extremely um, traumatizing. It was almost as if I left my body and I was watching it happen across the room. Um, and I got no support from my command when that happened. So then fast forward about a year goes by. I, I just got through as best I could. I had some guy friends that basically told the guy, if you don't leave her alone, she's going to report you. So do not talk to her. Don't go around her. Leave her alone. And that kind of helped me get through it. Then um, September 11th happened. As soon as it happened, I knew we were going to war. That's what we trained to do. I wasn't afraid or anything, surprisingly. I mean, I was 23 years old. <laughs> so I was deployed to Baghdad at the very beginning of the war, right after um, the Marines went in. So the Marines took the airport, I think, on like March 23rd. And I landed in Kuwait May 6th and was in Baghdad by like May 10th or something. Um, the environment was brutal. We didn't have showers. We had one bottle of water a day. We had two meals ready to eat in a bag. Um, the heat was 130 degrees in the summer. We showered out of a bucket. We peed in, in a dirt, like you dig a hole and you go. You know what I mean? So it was brutal. It was very brutal. Um, within a month, I dropped down 200 pounds. And if you've seen Medicaid Normal, you've seen the picture, but you can see all my ribs and my cheekbones. I mean, I, I was like starving to death. Everything I ate would just come right out. I was passing out, nosebleeds, fevers. And my command said, you know, you're mission essential. You're not going anywhere. So that added to my trauma because I thought, okay, I'm going to die in theater from either getting blown up because I'm running convoys three times a week, or I'm going to die from this mysterious virus that I have or whatever's wrong with me. Nobody knows because there's no testing here. Um, so it was like, I felt like I was not going to leave Iraq and not going to make it home and I'll never see my family again. And I just, you just feel trapped. You know what I mean? So then that led to like, now I'm starting to panic because like, I'm not, I'm going to die here. You know what I mean? But I kept doing my work. I was stoic. None of my soldiers knew. Everybody knew I was sick. They knew something was wrong, but like, I wasn't talking about it. I didn't tell anybody. I just was trying to do my, the best work I could do. And then after six months, we got a new commander and she medically evacuated me out of Iraq. And that is when hell broke loose, basically, let's say. So the very next day, my convoy got hit. My soldier came back. He told me um, everything that happened. He was laying there with all these stitches, like from his neck to his belly button. And he had a colostomy bag and just him retelling me, like, we got hit by an IED. It went through my back. I was bleeding to death. Nobody moved. He started to scream. And it was, it was at that moment that I was like, I can't control, I can't contain any more like horror. Like I, they say like trauma is that moment when like the experiences exceed your ability to cope with them. And that was it. That was the moment. And I quieted them down. I was like, okay, I got to go for now, but like, I'll come up, I'll come back and visit you later. I just got to go. And I walked down the hallway. I saw the sign for psychiatry. I marched right in there. And that was my first prescription of a benzodiazepine. Um, I got worse immediately. I remember feeling startled anytime a, fl a plane would fly over. Every time somebody slammed their door, I thought it was a gun going off. I thought the ceiling was collapsing on me. Um, so then I got medically retired. That process took about eight months. Um, I was basically given papers and a check and said, see you later, you're disabled at 24. Um, and to me, that was very devastating because I love the army. I was really good at what I did. I knew my job. I had way more awards than my commanders. Like I was always getting 
medals and coins and recognition. They always send me to like the best schools because I was really smart and I caught on. And that was like, all of that was gone in one day, basically, because I, I sought help, you know? Um, then very quickly I was medicated even more. So first it was a benzo, then it was Paxil. And then I complained that Paxil wasn't making me feel good. Then it was, my heart was racing. So they gave me a, a beta blocker. Then it was opiates because I was in pain. And then it was, let's try this other antidepressant. Now it's an antipsychotic. Now it's Ambien for sleep. And by 2006, I was on 18 at the same time. Um, I can only tell you that I barely remember many of those years because it was a blur. I was just so medicated and out of myself. I didn't leave my house for four years. Um, I went to all these programs and was like trying so hard. I was reading self-help books. There was a period of time where I, I was, I just thought of this when I was sitting here writing, I, I said, I was like laying in bed one day and I said, what book is it that I need to read? Like, what am I missing? I don't understand what I'm doing wrong. I'm like doing all these things. I'm trying so hard to get better, to heal this post-traumatic stress or whatever mental illness that I magically have now. And it's like, I'm doing everything, but I don't, what book am I missing? And this message was in my body and it was like, you have every book you need. And then I went and looked at the bookshelf. I'm sorry, I'm crying. I didn't think I'd get emotional, but I went to the bookshelf and I was looking at all the books and I was like, okay, it's not that one. I already read that one. I did that. It's not that. There's two books that I'll never forget that were on my bookshelf that I hadn't read yet. And one of them was Toxic Psychiatry by Peter Bregan. The other one was Not Crazy, You May Not Be Mentally Ill by Charles Whitfield. And I was like, maybe it's those two books. You know what I mean? So there was like a glimmer that like I had the answers, but I wasn't quite like there yet you know, or I don't, I don't know. So in 2006, at the height of those 18 medications, I, I met a psychiatrist who was like, who put you on all this? And I was like, well, civilians did it, but then the VA signed off on it because you guys like are looking at my records, you know? And he said, if I can get you a bed tonight, will you check in and I'll get you off some of this? And I said, yeah, you know, so I checked in and, uh, it was, you know, inpatient psych ward. And he took me off like 10 of them overnight. And I saw faces in the wood grains. And I saw people walking down the hallway with no heads. Like it was very scary. And I didn't quite understand what's happening to me. And he didn't say anything about withdrawal or anything. You know, it didn't last too long, but you know, I was still on like eight drugs at that point. So then let's fast forward, you know, 2008, 2009, 2010, I start getting off some of like one at a time, then, you know, two would go. And then I got off the ambient, I got off the antipsychotics and I'm still like on an antidepressant and benzos and some migraine medication, stomach stuff, you know, I'm still on all these things. And then I started feeling like better, just better enough to where I could go back to school and try to focus on other things. So that's what I did. I, I went back to school. I started my, my doctor wouldn't even sign off. He said I could only take yoga in college. And I laugh about that now, but only was approved for yoga. And then I begged, can you just do yoga in like English one? Because they, the school would not let me go unless I took two classes, but the VA did not want to sign off unless I take one. So I talked them into getting two classes. So it was English 101 and, and um, yoga my first semester. And then um, I was basically every semester, my doctor had to sign my paperwork and say, you're allowed to go to school, but you can only go half time. The stress is too much. You'll get worse, mentally ill, whatever he would say. And so I just said, you know, fine, that's just what I have to do. So I went part time to college all those years. It took me like 13 years to get through school completely. Um, and I just did the best I could. All the while I was getting these messages like, Angie, you're doing everything. You're, you're listening to everything they say. And like, you're not getting better. Like, what is it? What are you missing? And then I would like, I got a service dog and I was like, oh, this really helps me. So now I can get off some of the meds, you know? So I got off, you know, two or three meds or whatever. And I was like, let me try equine therapy. So then I went and tried equine therapy. And that was very pivotal because it was the first time that I felt that civilian people took an interest in me, but they didn't want to know what was wrong with me. They just wanted to like me to come outside and be in the sunlight and pet the horse and smell the horse and walk the horse around. And that was it. There was no expectations. There was no, like, there's something wrong with you, you know, cause I, I felt like so beaten down inside. Like, I, just, I don't know who I am and I don't know 
like what to do to fix myself and maybe you know maybe I'm, I'm worth broken because these meds work for other people but they don't work for me you know and I'm I'm doing everything so that was just uh, it really changed me a little bit inside that like oh wow these people I genuinely like you and they want you around and they don't want anything from you you know so that was that was a good turning point um and then I had three drugs left. I had Effexor and two benzos. I tried to get off Effexor. Uh, my doctor told me skip a day. Um, when I got down to like 38.5, he said, skip a day and then take it the next day and then skip a day and take it the next day and then skip two days. And next thing you know, I was in the emergency room and looking back at my medical records, I found out they actually diagnosed me with antidepressant withdrawal, which is kind of shocking. Cause like, how did he know that in 2010 or 11? but they don't know that now, you know, anyway. So then I was switched to a Cymbalta and I started to taper Cymbalta. It took me two and a half years to get off Cymbalta. I was left with two benzos and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm almost off. But I don't think like logically I thought like I would ever get completely off. I was just like, let me just see where this goes. Let's see how good I feel as I get lower on things. I didn't, I did not have like an end point in mind, really. I was just slowly, you know, slow and steady tapering as best as I knew how at the time. Um, during that period of time, I got really into physical fitness. I was running five K's. I did a tough mutter. I was doing CrossFit and I was tapered off Cymbalta and still left on two benzos. So I was doing like remarkably well, what the amount of drugs that had tapered, you know, and I knew kind of like what health felt like, like, wow, I'm starting to feel pretty good. I didn't feel great. You know, I would have like weird symptoms that I was kind of like, what is this? And I didn't even know it was withdrawal. I didn't have that understanding at the time. Um, but I just kept trucking. And then that's kind of when September of what was that year, 2015, I got lower and lower on the lorazepam and I started getting severe physical symptoms. I had pain in my spine that was so bad. I couldn't sit down to go to the bathroom. I was so desperate. Like I was like, give me an opiate, give me something pain really. I can't, I cannot even like think in school. I couldn't focus on anything. I was in so much like physical pain. I had to stop doing CrossFit. Um, I had to stop lifting any kind of weights. Uh, I I, like begged my doctor, like, you have to give me some, I can't, like, I'm going to kill myself. It's so painful. I can't deal with it. But he saw my MRI and he said, I'm looking at your MRI, but there's the, there's no physical evidence for the amount of pain that you're feeling. It doesn't make sense. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm not making it up. You know what I mean? Like it's there, you know? So now I learned later, that's actually a symptom of when you like hit tolerance. Like when my dose got so low, you know, I started getting these physical symptoms, but I didn't know what they were. Um, So then in January of 2006, basically I got, as I got lower and lower, I started getting more and more suicidal, except I knew there was this awareness, like, why am I suicidal? I'm almost done with my bachelor's degree. I have everything going for me. I'm feeling pretty good. I'm doing CrossFit. I have friends now I'm going to the gym why do I feel like I'm going to kill myself? I, this doesn't make sense to me. You know, um, it didn't make sense. And I told the psychiatrist and then, you know, of course here comes another diagnosis. Oh, now it's agitated depression. Now it's generalized anxiety disorder. And then that made me even more angry. Like you guys keep giving me these disorders, but like, I'm not getting any real help for it. Like, what are you going to do? Like fix it, you know? And so I started getting angry. So um, that was the series of these dis- little moments of disillusionment. And the next one came when I checked myself into the hospital and I asked for help. And I was like, I'm suicidal. I can't, I don't feel safe around myself. I need help. And then two police officers and a plastic wheelchair pulled up to pick me up. And I was just like shocked. Like, I'm not violent. I'm not yelling. I'm just so polite. I'm quiet. I'm introverted. I just need help. I'm just here voluntarily. And that really scared me a little bit. Like I like saw the, like the power of that. Um, and it kind of shook me. So basically let me try to speed up a little bit. I know I'm talking a lot, (laughs) but I was in the hospital for like five days. The psychiatrist said, um, you know, it's not, it'll be counterproductive if you stay here too long. So we're going to check you out on Friday. So I remember driving away from the hospital and I was kind of giggling to myself, like, ha ha, they, they thought I was addicted to benzos and I wasn't, cause I knew I wasn't, you know, I was tapering slowly and I was getting lower and lower. And I even stopped for Starbucks to have coffee on the way home from the hospital. And I went to the gym the next morning and then 
later in that afternoon, all the withdrawal symptoms kicked in. And I was like, I think I just went crazy, like completely, like, I don't know what happened. I didn't even know withdrawal was a thing. I have a bachelor's in psychology. I went to like the best medical school in the Midwest that was on our campus. And like, I never heard of this, never knew that there was a such thing as a benzo withdrawal, you know, even at a low dose. So I credit my friend Joy for, for kind of saving my life at that point, because I got scared to be alone and I went to her house and I was like, listen, I'm, I'm really mentally ill. Like you need to take me back to the hospital. And she's like, Angie, first of all, she said, we're all a little mentally ill. That's what she said. And I was like, okay, you have a point, you know? And then she said, but if you go back to the hospital, you know what they're going to do? They're going to put you back on more meds. And I was like, wait a minute. I don't, I don't think I can handle that. Like my brain was so upset by the imbalance at that time. I was like, no, I think that'll kill me. Like I'll be dead. Like this can't happen. So she let me stay at her house for 10 days. And she's like, you're the strongest person I know. If anybody can do this, it's going to be you and you're just going to have to do it and you're going to have to get through it. And that evening I Googled just by chance, benzo withdrawal. I don't know. It just dawned on me. I just Googled it and boom, there was all my symptoms. And then I found benzo buddies, which is an online forum. It's pretty anonymous. People post their um, personal stories, ask for help. Peers talk about, this is my symptoms. Is this, is this real? Do I need to go to a doctor? Like, is this what benzo withdrawal is? It's out of this world. And I posted my first little comment. It was like one sentence. I couldn't even hardly type. I was like, I'm supposed to start school in three weeks. Am I going to be able to do that? Like, what, what is this? And they're like, honey, this is going to last months to years. And I was like, what? Like, are you kidding me? Like, that was my first um, experience with it, the whole, with the whole thing. So what can I say? The next three years, I was completely out of it. I, I didn't speak for four months. I couldn't shower standing up for two and a half years. I was so dizzy. I had to everything. Like all my energy was in trying not to die. My symptoms were so severe. It was like, I couldn't even really talk about them. I know a lot of people here follow me on YouTube and I kept video diaries every six months of like what was happening, but I left a lot of the stuff out because I was in school and I didn't want to get kicked out of school and I didn't want people to like judge me for what I was feeling because some of the stuff was so taboo. But to give you the major highlights, my thoughts were like extremely loud, extremely intrusive, violent. It felt like like Satan and um, Stephen King like moved into my brain and just like took over. It felt like everything that was in my unconscious mind was just coming out. I was thinking about reptiles, about like evolution and how we're all just lizards. Like it was the scariest experience. Um, I was terrified, like just a little thought, like I want to go to the bathroom. It was like a scream inside of my head and it scared me and it would jolt me. I, I remember just like laying on my couch under my blanket, counting my heartbeats. And I was just like, don't think, don't think. And he thought like would just scare me. You know, it was so bad. I had like suicidal thoughts, homicidal thoughts burning on my skin. My, I could feel my brain wiggling inside of my skull. Um, I would wake up with numb hands in the morning. If I could even sleep at all, I slept like 20 minutes, the first 11 months, finally 11 months off. I got four hours in one night and I couldn't believe it. I could barely drive. I saw halos around lights. I had just like, couldn't stop moving when I would sit at a stoplight. I couldn't go grocery shop, nothing like everything. My whole, my whole nervous system just blew up. Let's just put it that way. It was extremely severe. But somehow I was able, basically it was a survival decision. I thought if I don't stay in school, I'm going to completely lose my mind. I have nothing to keep me in reality. I have no family that's really like supportive of me or checking on me or anything. I live alone. I don't have kids. I don't have a partner. Like I have to have something that is trying to like keep me what reality is because I'm not in it. So I dropped all my classes to down to one. And I took poetry classes or, or art classes with professors that knew me that I could tell what was going on to. And they didn't judge me. And, you know, the worst part about this whole experience is you look completely normal and you sound normal. But on the inside of your body, you're completely out of it. So for all they knew, I was fine, you know. But I had violent thoughts sitting in school. Um, sometimes I couldn't even walk out of the car to get to the classroom. I would run to the bathroom and wash my hands with hot water and splash my face with cold water. Like, Angie, get back in reality. Like you know, try to stay here. Anyway, I don't want to traumatize anybody in the audience because I know some of you are going through this right now, but I just wanted to tell you how severe it is because I'm here on the other side now. And I would say I'm probably like 80% healed. 
all of that is gone. All the burning stopped, all the brain wiggling stopped, all the terror stopped. I work out, I drink caffeine, I travel over the world, I meet strangers, I, I sleep in the desert, I'm not afraid of anything. <laughs> like it, it is real. Healing is real. Um, so during that, one thing that kept me going also was the Medicating Normal team. One of the filmmakers uh, messaged me on Facebook and said, can you tell me your story? And I was like, I'll tell you a little bit, you know, cause I had been in films before and I knew the whole thing and I knew, you know, everything that entails. And she's like, will you be in our film? And I was like, nope, mm -mm, I can't. I, I really thought I was going to kill myself, you know, at that point, cause I didn't think I'd make it. But so then she flew out and she, she basically talked me into it. And I remember when I dropped her off at her hotel and she closed the door I was like, well, shit, I, can't, I mean, I can't kill myself now because if I'm in the film and they film me at all, and then what are they going to do at the end, at the credits say, Angela was a great person, but she died by suicide. And then I thought, you know, people are going to say she's just this disgruntled vet and she had, she had problems her whole life and we tried to help her, you know, and then my family, what would they say? Oh, she's mentally ill. You know, she had tons of medical records. She was in and out of the psych. And I knew that was not the story. You know what I mean? I knew that was not what happened. What happened was I was given way too many psychiatric drugs. It completely screwed me up, but I was going to fight for any amount of health that I had. And I got really angry about that. Like, you're not going to kill me. There's no freaking way. Um, so through that, through the filming process of Medicaid normal, they would visit me like every six months and these camera people would come in my house and they'd ask me really personal questions and I would just share whatever, you know, and, and they recorded probably like, I don't know, out of all the video they recorded, maybe you guys see 2% of what happened. Like there was so much more that you didn't get to see, but um, they would tell me like, we just vid videoed Peter Gercha and this is what he said, or we just videoed Robert Whitaker and this is what he said. And I was like, oh, thank God. Like I am going to get better. Really? They're saying that. Okay, good. So that would like keep me going for six more months, you know? Um, so then, then when I got to a certain level of better, I went to master's of social work school. And then at that point they made me go full time. And I was like, I have no idea how I'm going to do this. I was like, I'm out of my mind. I'm just coming out of this, like the worst part. The first three years were the worst. I don't know what's going to happen, but my first day on campus, I told myself, this is brain injury rehab. Like you're going to be forced to talk to people. You're going to be forced to sit quietly and listen. You're going to have to look at people's faces and turn in homework. And I was like, okay, well, here we go. <laughs> Like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I found that program. Like I was triggered every single day, the way they talk about people with mental health problems with like these other people that are just like so sick and, you know, medication was completely left out of any of our, you know, there's nothing talked about medication wise. There was chuckles about like, I had this one professor that would say things like, um, oh, just wait when you're a therapist, you'll see, you'll know the second you see your patient, whether they need to be inpatient or not. And there was like all these jokes that I didn't think were funny. Mm. I was like, you're talking about me. You know, this is, this is, these are people like me that you're laughing about. It's not funny. Um, but I made it through that program with the 4.0. And it was because every ounce of my energy went to like trying so hard to listen to what the teacher was saying or read, you know, I couldn't even read. Like I had to reteach myself how to read. I audio recorded, I got accommodations so I could record the classes and re-listen to them on the way home. Um, I had somebody helping me edit my papers because like I couldn't even make sense of like what, like I'd read a sentence with and or or in the middle and I did not know how they would fit together. Like my brain just would stop in the middle of a sentence. Um, but that's, I got through it. So fast forward, I graduate, all my friends are getting social work jobs. And I was like, I don't wanna do that. And I don't think I'm ready to do that. I'm still severely injured. So I asked the filmmakers, hey, what if I took Medicaid Normal on the road? And I drove around to cities and I made appearances and we did like screenings and panel discussions. Would you guys support that? Like, sure. So we did about 75 in-person screenings around that time. And then boom, the pandemic happened and ruined everything. Totally ruined all our plans. So then I shifted and did everything from Zoom from the van. It wasn't what I wanted. Uh-oh, now it's going to beep. Sheila, did you hear that ding? Did you hear the ding? Did you guys hear the ding? Maybe not. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let me, sorry, sorry. Let me go back. So then I streamed the film from zoom from the van and we would do screenings in Brazil or in Mexico or Belgium. 
And it was really cool because we had all these really cool panelists from all over the world, researchers, academics, doctors, people that knew about this problem. Um, then we have audiences of patients, of doctors, of nurses. We did like 20 conferences. I think I wrote all the numbers down, but let me think. 35 interviews on Facebook. We did 20 conferences and 80 community screenings and 70 in person. So like 200 events. It was quite a few. Um, and it brought me like a lot of validation. Like Angie, you're not crazy. You're going to get through this. These are people, these people are talking about it. And that whole process, like it was extremely stressful emotionally. Like I'm like retelling my story over and over and over again. And you're sitting on a panel with a psychiatrist who's telling you, you know, I've had a couple psychiatrists like during panels, like try to diagnose me. And that was like extremely triggered. Like, no, I'm fine. You guys, you know, like stop. Uh, but it was good. It was a really good experience. I, it kept me busy. It helped the, it helped me distract. It let the time die. And I felt like I was really doing something with that time. Now I kind of call that suffering. Well, like you're going to suffer in this process, but like, what are you going to do while you're suffering? You know, are you going to kick and scream and be angry at the doctors or like, for me, I just like funneled all of that into work and like trying to make a change about the subject and try to help people get through it. That's kind of what I did with it. Um, so some of my favorite moments during that, that process was I got to meet Peter Gocha in person and we tried to check him in his hotel and like, okay, go take a rest before your panel. And he was like, no, 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 I want to talk to you. So I said, well, Dr. Gocha, I want to show you something and I'll show you guys this. I don't usually pull this out, but this is my list of medications that they had me on for, um, 13 years. And I said, here, Dr. Gertrude, will you look at this? And then I scrolled and I scrolled and I scrolled. And then he went like this. You got to write about this. They did that to you. And he got, he got, he got like more angry than I think I was able to let myself get angry. And that felt validating, you know, like he sees, like he sees the horror, you know, Another favorite moment was Bessel van der Kolk and Bob Whitaker on the same panel. And I was sitting with them and I was like, oh my God, these people like got me through it, you know? And then I had one more what was the other one. Oh God, I don't know. Oh, David Cohen from UCLA. So he's in the film, but I spent a whole day with him and we just talked and we cried and he showed me all his books that he wrote about this. And I asked him, I said, David, how did you figure this out that people were being harmed by medications? And he's like, I just listened to my patients. They told me if you just listen and they tell you and it's like, Oh my God, like, why don't more people listen? You know? Anyway. So that's been my journey. And in February I left Medicaid normal. So I could kind of like reevaluate, like, what do I want to do? What do I want the next few years to look like? What do I need for me to, to heal a little bit more? Um, and then of course I like, didn't give myself much of a break. Next thing I know, all these people are coming to me for help. And so I started coaching people through the process I started getting people that I didn't expect, like families were really attracted to me for some reason. And we would just talk about like, how do you avoid medications for your eight-year-old? Or like, what can you do for your, your, your family member who is diagnosed with schizophrenia, but the medications have not worked for them. And they just keep deteriorating. Like, what else can you try? You know, cause I had done everything. I like tried everything there was to try. I researched everything. You know, I, I seen what has helped people in withdrawal or help people live better lives without medication like what am I going to do because like I'm still going to have panic I still went through trauma I'm still going to have to live with some of this stuff it doesn't just magically go away so I just started coaching and then I fell in love with it honestly like I feel bad because when a new person comes to me I always smile and I'm like hi it's good to meet you hi what's your name like tell me your story and I, I, I like I have to hold myself back like Angie don't smile this person is suffering but it's like I'm smiling because I know the ability of the body's the body's ability to heal itself. Like I just watched it happen to myself and I didn't believe I would ever, but I get like happy. Cause I'm like, I genuinely like, these people, but I also like believe in their healing and I know they're going to get better. And they're going to like, they're going to come out of this experience, like with a whole new outlook on life. And just like, it's like you reevaluate everything that you believe about everything. And then you come out better for it. So I'm just like, I'm excited. I get to watch that happen, which I think is like a sacred thing, you know, to watch somebody heal, to watch somebody suffer. It's so hard and it's so painful. I've cried with many of the people I talked to. I mean, there was somebody in protracted last week. We just cried for the whole half an hour. Just like, this is just so hard, you know, and there's just like no good answer. And it's um, isolating and 
extremely painful, but I do love it. All right. So where are we are? Where are we now? So I, I wanted to talk about really quick about some of the trends that I see. So this is basically the trend. People have situational pain. They break up with a boyfriend. They go through a divorce. A loved one dies, a miscarriage. Um, these are the stories I hear over and over and over again. They get put on birth control. They feel depressed. They leave for college. Just some normal like life thing. Then they get put on the medication. Their doctor doesn't say anything. They're on it for months or years, sometimes 40 years. Then at some point they start feeling weird. Like, I don't know. I just don't feel good. Something's wrong. Maybe I have cancer. Maybe I have diabetes. I don't know what it is. So they start seeking healthcare in one way or another. They get a bunch of tests run. Nobody looks at their medication. Nobody says like, why have you been prescribed Lexapro for 30 years? That doesn't make sense. Nobody calls out like the medication could be part of the problem. Then the person keeps doing this. They get frustrated. Maybe they start Googling symptoms. Maybe they start, it dawns on them. There's usually an intuition involved. Like, wait, maybe it's the meds. Like, let me just Google Lexapro or let me Google whatever. And then somehow they find the online communities. They'll find surviving antidepressants. They'll find the withdrawal project. They'll, they'll see an article in the New Yorker or in New York Times or, you know, the daily news in UK something. And they'll be like, oh my God, it's my meds, you know? And then they find their way to the community. They figure out, oh my God, my doctor never told me what was going to happen. They get the devastating news that it's going to take months to years to taper and to feel better. And that nobody can tell them like how long it will take or how severe it will be. They could taper perfectly and they could still turn out, you know, with severe symptoms. And then um, it's like, they just have to fight. They have to fight through it. There's no other way around it. There's no doctor. There's no magic pill to fix it, to take it away. Nothing like that. Um, there's a lot of grief involved, a lot of emotion. People's families don't understand. They don't want to hear it. I talk to a lot of family members and I actually like that when like it's husband and wife, like let's all talk about it, you know, um, try to educate them as best as we can. And that's one good thing about Medicaid normal lens in the audience, but you know, people watch that and their family members watch it and they're like, oh my God, it makes sense. Like it's so quick. They, they get educated in such a short period of time that, you know, the rest of us don't have to sit there and explain it to them. And, you know, when you're the one suffering, it's like your mom telling you to get back by curfew. Like you don't listen to your mom. Like, you know what I mean? So you need like something outside of yourself to explain it to you. So uh, it's super helpful for that. So that's kind of what is going on grassroots doctors are not educated they're admitting that now but the amount of things that i hear that doctors tell patients like it's shocking like things like you can have that and then have it next week and you'll be off in two weeks you'll be fine or somebody told me last week this is i should keep track of these because i hear good ones like every day somebody told me last week like their doctor said um akathisia is really rare there's only one reported case and um what did they say? You're the second case. It's so rare. There's only one case, but you're the second. That was a good one. But anyway, so it's, it's, it's kind of heartbreaking to hear what's going on. Um, and I do feel like this is some kind of new field that is emerging. There's a couple other withdrawal coaches. Maybe there will be do prescribing coaches in the future. I don't know. I don't like the professionalization of anything like that, but it's like, there's such a demand and such a need for people to like hear that they're not crazy they will get through this. My symptoms are normal. You can go get medically checked out when they rule out everything else. It's got to be your meds. What else could it be? Like, what else is it? You know what I mean? But there's really no help for this. There's no uh, understanding at like a community level. People have never heard of it unless it's happened to them or a family member. Um, but I, I could even take that back because like this morning at the gym, somebody asked me, what do you do? And I was like, I help people get off psych drugs. And they're like, what? that's so cool. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, my friend, he couldn't get off benzos. And then the, the girl next to me, everybody my age is taking sleeping pills. And I just keep telling them to exercise because you have extra energy in your body. You just need to burn it and go to sleep. And they don't want to do that. They just want the pill. Like, yeah, it's more common than you, than you, than you get, you know, we give it credit for, but so that's kind of what I'm seeing. All right. So all that said, whew, I'm out of breath and I'm almost done. So we can open the floor because I know you all have things to share. I can see the comments, but I can't read them yet. I'm so sorry, but I'm almost done. All right. So 
basically what I do now is I give informed consent to families and people that are tapering. I give health education around like, what does tapering look like? How do people taper? How do you talk to your doctor? I've talked to psychiatrists. I'm not scared of them anymore. <laughs> like I know more than they do. And, and they've admitted that in some cases. Um, then I kind of like teach holistic mental health. Like, what are we going to do? Like, th- we don't have another choice. We have to do these things like to survive. Like I have to do guided meditation to sleep. You know, I had to do mantras. Like I am healing. I am healing. I am healing. I said that probably 80,000 times when I, more than that, 8 billion times in withdrawal. And then there's always this, how do I recreate my life if I don't believe I'm bipolar anymore? Or how do I make sense of like what happened to me all those years or like all the decisions I made that I didn't, wasn't like fully in my body or feeling my emotions. And like, I, you know, the experiences people reflect on, it's like their whole life was altered. I know mine was like, I didn't feel things. I messed out on friends and family, my thirties, my sex life. Like I lost all kinds of stuff, you know? And then like, where do you go from here? When you realize what the problem is, you get through it to some extent and you have to rebuild a new life. And you don't even know what that, you don't even know what you like anymore. Like, who am I? I don't even know. Like, do I like to walk or play volleyball? Like, I don't know. I got to figure it out, you know? Um, so that, so that's, that's that. So some of my current projects, I'm working really hard on my being human RV page. That was basically like me going on the RV and trying to work on myself and heal myself. And I, it's still an ongoing process. Like every day I learn a little something about myself or, or the world, um, been in touch with a few psychiatrists that are hip on this finally, and they're they're starting to help people come off meds. And like, how can I help the pe- people that they see? I'm involved with another documentary film. I'm, I don't want to say the name of it yet because it's not final, but um, it's about the same subject. And they're about to do their outreach, so I'm going to probably help them with their outreach. Then I was interviewed for another documentary film just today about the intersection of the built environment and health. So for instance, when a doctor prescribes walking, like instead of an antidepressant, most people don't have access to like walking trails or walking in a safe neighborhood or even a sidewalk. And it's about like, through my own healing process, I moved into a new urbanist um, uh, neighborhood on purpose because I was like, I don't have to drive. Like I can walk to the grocery store and neighbors are going to talk to me because our doors are close together. And so I I did that very purposely. Um, that was the neighborhood I was living in a Medicaid normal. But anyway, so there's more films coming out about this. Um, I've gotten reinvolved with Wounded Warrior Project. So they just did a photo shoot with, shoot with them last week. And then I'm going to do another one on Monday with Dish Network and Wounded Warrior Project. And really, I keep that f- platform because I try to insert this narrative somehow about like, you are not ill. You don't like Prozac is not going to fix your trauma. Like there is things that help. You know, so it's like any opportunity I can see to like try to further awareness about this, like I'm, I hang on to it, you know, and then in the future, I want to do a uh, in-person workshop. So we're planning the first one in Sedona, Arizona. It'll probably be in March, but it might be in January. It depends on the venue right now, but I want to do in-person workshops about tapering, informed consent with psychiatric drug withdrawal and like holistic mental health. I don't know what else to call it, but that's it. Also, I've recognized the problem within the community. There's so much to read and people can't digest it and they just cannot comprehend. Like, what do you mean? I don't understand how to taper. Like my brain is so altered right now. Like I've had to literally like spend hours with people to teach them. Like, this is what, this is how you, you got to talk to the pharmacist and ask them about this. You know, this is how you got to do it. So I'm, I'm working on creating new videos and blogs and maybe some support groups, trying to expand the website. And I want to do more speaking engagements and healing and like a TED talk about this. Like that would be my dream if I could get this on a TED talk. Like I think it's too controversial yet. They're not there yet. But anyway, so that's it. Um, Thank you for listening. That's a lot. I can't believe I just talked for 48 minutes. That's so much. And I got a bunch of comments here, but I feel like I should just open the floor. How about let's just open the floor. So you can turn your microphone on and talk. Sheila, will you take me off the spotlight? Here it is then I can see everybody. Okay, now I can see everybody. So, oh my God, I see all new people here now. So does anybody want to talk? I just bared my whole soul. (laughs) What? What? Martha. Yeah, it's me. Um, Can you talk about how you deal with the anger of, like I lost 20 years of my life to these damn drugs 
and I'm never going to get that 20 years back. Ooh, that's a hard one. I feel like I want to ask you how you deal with it first. How have you dealt with it? Sometimes really well and sometimes not well at all. Sometimes I just, I get angry at little things that that's not really what I'm angry about. Yeah. So I always feel like I'm, I'm trying to push it down so I don't explode at someone that doesn't deserve that. Almost like a, that I'm, I'm visualizing that puppet where you put the jack in the box. <laughs> yep. You know, Ooh. and finding, you know, some of the things you talked about, finding things that, that do make me feel good, but often it's still in the background. Like I'm just so angry all the time. Yeah. I mean, I think, I, I don't know. I'm definitely aware of that. I just try not to live in it. And I think that energy tends to go towards like helping or activism. I try to like funnel it, but I agree with you that it's like, it's always in the background. Like what could my life have been like if that didn't happen or like things will happen. Like, I hope this is not too personal, but last week I was wearing a really short shirt and I looked down at my, I saw wrinkles coming here and I was like, how did I get so old? Like, like in my head I think I'm like 18 you know what I mean it's like I've aged 20 years and I didn't get to experience like the 20s like when you you know you party and you have sex and you go to concerts and you drink a lot and you know I didn't I missed that like that was very like that was like two years in the army and that was all the fun I got to have and the rest of it was being a patient Mm -hmm. so things like that or like at the gym I noticed I just started being able to work out like three months ago and I've been working out like six days a week like nonstop. like my legs are so strong you guys you wouldn't believe (laughs) <laughs> like they're like rocks but anyway like I'll be at the gym and there'll be people that I think are my age like 30 ish I'm 43 though and then I start to like run and I try to keep up with them and I can't and I'm like Angie you're older like you're not you're not who you think you are in your head you know so things like that happen but honestly I just try to stay in the present moment like one thing that experience did teach me is like like life is fragile you know what I mean? That like at any moment could be taken away. Like your health can just go, you know what I'm saying? And so like you live on the edge of that for so long. Like, I think that's why I do things like live in the van or say yes to everything. Like, I just want to experience everything I missed out on. Mm -hmm. Like you live really hard. Like I just want to live and I don't want to be consumed with anger or, and I'm not saying the anger is bad. Like there's a place for it. Absolutely. You, sh- you have every right to be angry. Like they took so much from us, you know? Um, I just try not to li- like live in it, but I do snap at people sometimes. <laughs> it's there. Yeah, it's there. Anybody else? Come on. It's, I, I, I was just going to touch on what the two of you, t- and then I had two other things on my own, try to be quick, but um. On, on the anger thing, if it's any consolation, I was thinking while you're talking, I've had, you know, I'm a couple decades older than you, um, had a bunch of time stolen for different kinds of reasons. But one thing I realize is, is having chronic health conditions and psychiatric challenges younger in life actually taught me a lot of lessons that will help me age better. Um, like I actually was like on crutches, unable to walk too. And I had, you know, I had physical trauma in addition to, to mental, but the healing process that we go through, that sort of like you wake up one day and all the things we have to do to cope and deal with our recovery, I guarantee you when you're like 80 or 85 or 90 years old, it will be so much easier to do those things because we've learned those skill sets earlier in life. So yeah, we've lost a lot of time, but there's a little bit of consolation lining in there. I like that. Um, we may also appreciate that time we have more than other people. I like that. Um, so let's see my two things. Um, I almost forgot. I'm sorry. I, where I am, it, it's almost nine o'clock. I started at 5 a.m. So, and this is the fourth of my work day. My brain is mush. So bear with me. <laughs> okay, um, and that was also the reason I was late. I'm sorry. Um, so I just wanted, I think I've shared this in some of your other forums before, but I just want to add a slight slight variation on the experience with medication and our um, DSM system, which is that, you know, my experience was that I was having adverse reactions to drugs that were creating disabling and committable psychiatric um, adverse effects, and nobody believed me. Um, It started about 12 years ago. I was disabled enough to be on SSDI, but 
what's so frustrating to me, and I was a healthcare lawyer before I got really sick, right? And I used to like negotiate stuff around DSM categories and healthcare contracts. And the only way I can get insurance for treatment is for people to put me in a mental health DSM category that I don't actually have the symptoms for, but it's based on my biological response, based on my chromosomal makeup, my genetic response to certain drugs. Mm -hmm. So I, for example, have the same sort of significant adverse drug reactions that people who are diagnosed with bipolar one half. Everybody gets very excited and thinks I'm going to be suicidal tomorrow and locks me up against, you know, all that stuff because I have the same biological basis, but I'm actually not in that framework. I don't fit that framework at all in a lot of ways. And I see that as another major flaw from an, it's, it's kind of like people like me who have a genetic predisposition to put me at risk for the way people practice medicine. There's no category for me. So they put me in bipolar other because that's yeah. how we get me covered for the medication I need to take to reverse the effects of the brain damage and the trauma I got from the adverse drugs. Um, so I just wanted to sort of raise that as like a flip side. And I've had just as much struggle educating providers. And now that I can get, you know, genetic testing under Medicare, um, sort of really fighting for people to listen to me about this. But back when they first poisoned me with tramadol 12 years ago, because it was like the less addictive, less narcotic, narcotic. And I ended up getting committed four times on it. Um, you know, it's taken 10 years for me to get one or two people who has an MD after their name to listen to me about this. So I just wanted to add that sort of flavor of the story. It's a different kind of medical establishment harming me with drugs. It's not yeah. the kind that you were describing, but it's a, oh, well, let's just yeah. give them this like totally harmless stuff, except that I end up inpatient for three weeks because of it every time yeah. they do it. And they don't listen to me when I tell them. Um, yeah. And, Oh, the last point. <clears throat> so I was a certified peer specialist for five years, mental health peer specialist for five years at a drop-in center doing triage and mm -hmm. groups and one-on-one -on -one support. I just switched over um, to be a mass health care coordinator. And we're doing really cool stuff here in Massachusetts that's more patient-centered. But I'm really interested to see in the future, you know, you're doing stuff on an individual basis. I know that sometime soon you will be partnering with somebody for the VA to be able to make this kind of thing accessible if you ever can. And I just wanna put the plug in that, that my mass health folks, like my Medicare, Medicaid folks need this too. It's yeah. a very similar um, group of challenges. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of overlap in the social determinants of health. A lot of people who are unhoused and have substance abuse histories and have been medicated this way. Mm -hmm. And the people that I support now who are, are Medicaid people desperately need this kind of support. Sure. So that's my, that's my two things. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, Ellen, next. Well, first, Angie, I just want to say congratulations. This is fabulous what you're doing. And I just, you have, as you know, all my support because I just, I really believe in what you're doing. Um, and as you know, within a week, we took our last, within a week of each other, we took our last little sliver of a pill. And I want to address the question about anger and also just the reality that I live in now, because it is almost seven years now that I've been off and, and you have too. And the reality is, is I am a different person. I am not the same person. And I, the anger that was being spoken to, the anger is really, for me, is really undone when I let myself grieve because I can't really access the same person that I was. And so what I know to do now is to spend the time that it takes to tap into the deeper part of my body, my embodied experience, not the mental experience, not the thinking about it, not the rest of it, but the embodied experience and find the place where I can actually comfort the part of me that wants to be who she used to be and cannot be. And I want to say that because I, I think a whole new life opens up. It's not like, it's not like I can go back. And I, I want to say that for the benefit, you know, it's like, I can't go back. 
And so those years are lost. And now I go forward and create the life that emerges because I'm taking care of myself. By virtue of the fact that I'm taking care of myself, life emerges differently. And yes, I go through enormous amounts of grief uh, around it. And that's where my anger goes. But mostly I wanted to just say, Angie, go girl. Yeah. Go. Well, I have to say, Ellen is in a writing group with me with one of the professors who helped me get through acute withdrawal in college. And she has a writing group and I named it Word Church because it's like you get to express that anger. Like I wrote about my withdrawal while it was happening and I have that forever. And it was, I couldn't even write the words sometimes, you know, but so Ellen is my writing sister. <laughs> okay, next is Renee. You just gotta press unmute. Can't hear you yet. Nope. Look in the bottom left. There's a little microphone where it says mute. Or maybe we'll let, here we go. I just clicked ask. There you go. Perfect. Go ahead. Um, well, I'm Renee Buchanan and I have been, I guess you would say in the mental health system since my since my early 20s, and I'm 64 now. Mm -hmm. um, I actually I found out about this and about Medicaid and Normal from my psychologist, uh, whom I've had for the last 20 years, um, who is actually the person who recognized that um, all of the things I had been told I was by psychiatrists and other therapists, um, I was not those things. And uh, so I hear you that she suggested you watch Medicaid Normal? What? Did she suggest you watch Medicaid Normal? Yes, I did. That what I, did watch, I did watch it. Yes. I, I've, a psychologist I've, told you. My, yes. Yeah, yeah, Mary Marks. I think you know she is. Oh, Mari Marks. Yes. yes. That's awesome. Okay. That's awesome. I know her. She and then she, uh, you know, uh, got me an invitation to this because nice. she thought that it was important um, nice. for me to hear, uh, you know, what your story and, and where you were going. Nice. Um, you know, my, I, I spent God knows how many years in and out of hospitals. It was, uh, it was like a, a, a revolving door. I would be out, I would be in some treatment program and then I would be back in the hospital. And I reached the point where the only place I felt safe was in a hospital mm -hmm. because I didn't know how to be in the world. And I didn't know how to make sure that I didn't, when I was having suicide, suicidal thoughts, not do some, not, give in to them um and in those in that revolving door time i was prescribed oh i was given many different diagnoses um none of which were ever really explained to me it was just sort of like well this is what we see happening so here's and here's a medication to help it and then someone else would say well no that's not really helping so Hear this, and then one day I was talking to this psychiatrist. We actually called him Minute Rice. His name was Dr. Rice, and we called him Minute Rice because that's about how long he spent with you. Wow! wow. And uh, I said to him just that sometimes I felt like I was supposed to kill myself. It was just mm -hmm. a comment, and he said, "Oh, you're schizophrenic," and. He prescribed, I think the first thing was lithium, which I became toxic. And eventually, uh, instead of schizophrenic, I was diagnosed schizoaffective but, because they didn't know what to do with me. So that's just sort of a catch-all. And, um, and I was given Clausewitz. Mm -hmm. um, 
And for four years, and during the four years that I was on Rail, I had ECT three separate times, uh, 13 treatments each time. I always said, oh, the 13th must have been one to grow on. And, um, and I don't remember that four years at all. I mean, there's a lot of time that's a blur, but that four years is completely gone. Yeah. And all I know from that four years is what people have told me. And it's some scary stuff, you know, yeah. like like driving under the influence of Clausero on the freeway, thirty two miles an hour in the fast lane, and mm-hmm. and sleeping, sta- taking a shower, standing up, sound asleep, and just you know, and and it was at the end of of that when I was finally someone recognized I wasn't schizophrenic that I met. Uh, Beth Marks, and uh, that's been 20 something years ago or so. And my my challenge is, you know, I I think, you know, I I think back on all that. I see all this this stuff that happened. I see how ridiculous it was that one sentence from my mouth changed my life completely. And, um, you know, I kind of think that Clausero, because I've seen people who are schizophrenic who take it and it has made a vast, a huge difference in their lives. For me, I didn't need it. And it's like it did to me what it was supposed to not, what it was supposed to help people with. Yeah, yeah. And I... I feel lucky that I have a brain. I feel lucky that I have a liver that functions basically, you know, basically okay. Yeah. Um, and you have I, a good you have a good doctor right now. So yes, I, would say, I listen to her, stay on yep. track with her. She's yeah. she's you know, she's I, I am extremely lucky that that she came my way during one of my hospitalizations. And uh, I just wonder you know i'm still on one antidepressant and um out of it because when i came off of all those other medications that i was on i started having severe panic attacks and i went to the emergency room i don't know how many times thinking i was having a heart attack and i did not want to admit that it could be anything, but I did not want to admit that I was having panic attacks because I thought this whole cycle with medications would start all over again. I mean, I guess I thought I was cured. Would it be helpful, Renee, if I send you some resources after this? Because I don't want to, yes. I don't want to cut you off, but there's like six other people. No, I understand. Yeah. So how about I'll send you some resources. Okay. And maybe that'll help get you started on the whole tapering thing. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Good. I know it's scary. I know. I know it is. All right. Brand- All right. Brandolyn. Hi, um, I'm Brandolyn. I am up in uh, Western uh, Michigan. And um, I, I think, you know, I, I wanted to start out by saying thank you, Angie. I mean, I, I've, you know, I've never heard you get that detailed about your story. And um, you know, gosh, the, the the fact that you are giving here, um, you know, that you're that you're here right now. I mean, you know, that that just kind of keeps me going. So thank you. Um, I did want to say that, um, you know, I don't know. Um, I wanted to say that six months off meds now. Um, you know, I've got a long way to go. I like that I recognize now that I have a long way to go. I I like being able to look back at where I began and think, gosh, I never thought I'd get here. Um, And and I never thought where I'd get to where I was last month or the month before that. And so, um, I I, I don't know. I mean, I I, I really raised my hand to say thank you, but, but listening to everyone else and that sort of thing, I. I just want to say that, you know, there, there's no way through this except to put your head down and go through, you know, there's just no shortcut through it. There's no, you know, there's no supplement. There's no, you know, 
a procedure or protocol or whatever. You just got to get through it and everybody's going to pick whatever works for them, but it's probably within yourself and not outside. So, you know, um, I just, you know, I, I'm a student right now, you know, and, um, and I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't be that had I not gone through this experience and I'm not grateful for the experience or anything like that, but I sure am glad that I'm not doing this by myself, even though I feel terribly alone. So thank you. Thank you for being here. All right, Beatrice. Hi, Angie. Hi. And thank you so much for sharing your story again. Yeah. And I, I'm really glad we, and everybody else as well so far. I really appreciated this talk, this beginning to talk about anger. And at Inner Fire in Vermont, we help people come off their psychotropic beds also. And um, one of the first emotions I've noticed as people begin to taper is anger. And, and I see anger as really blocked creative energy, energy that should be flowing but has been dammed up. Mm you know, for so many years. So we really encourage people to claim their anger. Yeah, but direct that energy in a really creative way. And that's, that's um, and it's remarkable. Actually, we've just hired two of our graduates to work for us at Inner Fire. And that's very exciting. Mm -hmm. I'd love this place to be run by graduates at some point. And um, I just wanted to share also that a doctor from the West Coast contacted me, telling me her, this was years ago, five or six years ago, her main clientele are suicidal psychiatrists. And you know, these psychiatrists, they're caught in the same system, mm -hmm. you know? And, and um, so I would also love one day for Inner Fire to be a place where there could be retreats for psychiatrists and healthcare practitioners to learn how to come help people get off the meds they put them on. Mm -hmm. And they could join in with the therapies and chopping wood and all that as well, <laughs> try to help balance their lives. And because it must be awful, the majority of their patients, they either zombify or are suicidal, you know, mm -hmm. and it, it must be an awful situation to be in so it's a whole it's such a whole um so system yeah yeah but um yeah so anyway I'm really grateful and the more we can work together and yes. and help people to reclaim their lives it's and it's um it's hell warmed up but it's you know as many people have said you got to keep going and stay our, our emphasis here at Inner Fire is to stay willfully engaged. So when you're feeling a bit manic, you chop wood, you know, yeah. or you're working in the garden or you're learning how to cook properly, you know, mm -hmm. so that you can eat, you know, there's no excuse to not eat well, gut, you know, gut friendly if you want to. Yeah. But it's, it's amazing. Yeah. And thank you, Angie. And it's, it's exciting and you're going to do amazing. You keep going. You're doing amazing work. Thank, Thank you. you, Beatrice. And I'll come visit very soon, maybe summer. Please, please do. Summer in Vermont. Okay. I will come visit. I promise. You're on my list. I swear. I hope so. I I'll hope so. There. It, it is wonderful to have you with us. I yeah. love it. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Brian. Hello. Can you hear me? Yep. Sound loud and Hello. clear. Uh, Thank you for sharing your story. Um, I am uh, like about 16 months off and, um, I just went through some serious health issues, um, completely unrelated. And um, mm -hmm. I was very scared going in, even though I was in excruciating pain, I was actually more afraid of a setback. because I've been doing fairly well since about a year off. Um, and I've heard a lot of uh, scary stories. So I just kind of wanted to bring up, you know, the subject of, I got to a point of pain where I, I mean, they threw five different antibiotics at me and they were cycling me off lunch stuff. I was, I was willing to do anything at that point. Um, so if, if you've dealt with that yet, mm -hmm. like um, since you've come off like situations where you kind of have to take something or yeah, for I me, I, 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 um, I pushed it off a lot of days because I did not want to take antibiotics and it got really bad where I was literally crying in pain. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I know you've been off for a while. So I just kind of wanted to hear like what, how you've dealt with that or the fear of like, what if someday I have to take this because of this, et cetera. 
So I just kind of wanted to bring that topic up. I'm doing way better, by the way, and I didn't have any setbacks. So there's some hope, but... Good. You're nervous and strong again, probably. Yeah, uh, last year, actually a year from now, last year, I had to get a breast biopsy and they injected me with carbocaine into my breast, which I'll never do again. And I broke out in a rash for 45 days and I was the worst, I mean, literally my entire body. Um, and I, we don't know if I'm allergic to, like if it was stress related, I don't think it was stress. I think it was a reaction to the preservative in the drug, but I didn't have a choice. Like I tried bromelain and quercetin and it didn't work. And then I was like, I have to take an antihistamine. I don't know what I'm going to take. They wanted me to take steroids and all this cream and stuff. And I was like, no way. There's no freaking way. It's a rash. Like I'll cope. But I mean, it was so painful that I scratched myself to where my skin thickened. Like that was how severe it was. But I took 22 days of Zyrtec and I was fine. I just felt like a little bit of wiggly in my legs and it didn't feel good. But, um, and then I had COVID in July. And I had an excruciating headache because my fever was pretty high, but I just, I was like laying like this for like three hours with my headache. And I was like, Angie, just take some children's Tylenol. It's fine. So it was the first time in seven years that I took any kind of NSAID, but it was a children's Tylenol dose this big and I was fine. But yes, the fear is real. I mean, I had to go with my sister to a medical procedure where it was like surgery and there's all these doctors and nurses coming in and I could barely sit there and I could barely like engage with the system at all. It was, I'm terrified, but I, I kind of look at that, like it's my body protecting me from further harm. You know, it's some of it might be intuition. Some of it might be like a response to the trauma I went through, but I just, I try not to think about it. Like just live your life and do the best you can. And if something bad happens, you're going to be able to handle it the same way you handled this. And then the further you get out, the further away from the injury that you get, the stronger you feel. And it's like, oh, I can handle it if something bad happens. I don't want it to, but I think I could handle it, you know? So that's kind of part of the healing, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Michael. I'm sorry for the delay while I find the buttons. I'll just, oh, uh, I'll just say uh, uh, just... Uh, briefly in reference to the the comment about how it's hard for physicians to uh, I totally agree with that so I got interested in mindfulness attended a whole bunch of what amounts to continuing magic medical education courses where you know people discover that meditation is sometimes helpful to some extent and what you'll find in those courses is an awful lot of medical doctors who you know have started to question things that uh, can't be questioned, you know, and uh, the, the experience of doctors in many cases is their training is not easy. So they show up, they matriculate at medical school. It turns out not to be what they thought. Okay. And it gets much, much worse uh, as you go on. And there's kind of a, a, I don't know what you would call it, an institutional trauma that develops. And then the residency is not fun for anyone. So there's kind of, you know, lack of sleep and this kind of thing. And they're kind of waiting for, you know, what they were promised to start, but then what they discover is they're a kind of wage slave sometimes, or at least this is the experience that's reported sometimes. You're actually a wage slave in many countries and you know, you're know you expected to see so many patients a day. It's very hard to be present with a patient when you're expected to see one every five minutes. And so there's an awful lot of doctors who are just barely hanging on actually. And, and uh, there's a doctor, uh, Patricia Weebel, I think her name was written extensively about that. And it's all she does now, uh, I think, is treat uh, these doctors who are, you know, really on their knees uh, because of their jobs and their path that they took. So what I'll say is that there's an awful lot of in-system doctors who are very uneasy, causes an awful lot of distress, and they are popping pills like rock stars, some of them, but they won't admit it. Okay. And so uh, you have to kind of be gentle. And I regret that social media wars where they're attacked because actually the person you're attacking, they, they eat their young, first of all. So if you grow up and you start to question antidepressants and things like that, they will eat their young actually, they will, that you will be attacked very viciously. So they are constrained in what they can say. So I'll just say that uh, it would be good to reduce the level of conflict that I see on social media. It is not productive and, and not really winnable, but the stories have to be told. So I'll just say that. And oh, the other thing I is that I, I, you. Thank you yeah. for saying that. Go ahead, keep going, sorry. 
sorry, I, I just want to say one other thing is that, uh, like, I have a lot of quantitative training that, uh, you know, that I've kind of put to use in this area. And so I did a hell of a lot of research into, you know, tapering. It was an interesting question. And uh, I did a lot of research into it and have written a bit of software that kind of suggests uh, what's known as pharmacologically informed tapering, let's say. And all I can tell you is that's about 5% of it. So I, I told, like, what I always tell people who, you know, look at calculators is like 5% of it. And 95% uh, of it is exactly what you were saying, Angela. It's uh, like, it's about living for me. Like you just want to live. And, you know, the grief part is very hard. Like how many years did I lose? In that direction lies, you know, it's not productive, I'll say. So just living is what I can report. So just, you know, try, try to live and, you know, the archeology, span has not been terribly helpful, but you have to unhook what got you into the doctor's office in the first place. That's the project actually is to unhook why you showed up on the worst day of your life in this office and it's the wrong office. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop there because I'm taking up all the oxygen, but that's kind that's of no, I just wanna, Yeah, <laughs> I do wanna say, I do wanna say one thing about Twitter. Um, I tried to, I tried to get into it, man, but I just can't because every time I post something like yesterday, I think a couple of days ago, I asked the question, dear clinicians, how do you know the difference between side effects or adverse reactions and people that are in distress? And then I got attacked from survivors saying, yes, psychiatric drug withdrawal is distress. And then clinicians were too scared to answer. And then the few clinicians that did answer all the survivors attacked them. And I was like, we're not going to get anywhere like this, because there's this, there's this phrase that I, it always sticks with me that the harder you try to fight to get outside of the cage, the more they will put you back in it. So like the more you act crazy, the more they're going to be convinced that you are crazy, you know? <laughs> so it's like you have your hands tied behind your back. So I don't know about Twitter, but I can't, I can't do it. I can't, I try, I really try, but I get attacked by both sides and nothing good happens out of it. Anyway, Andrea, I'm happy to see you here. Thank you. Um, Hi, I'm Andrea. I live in St. Louis. Um, that's it's kind of hard for me to follow up after that last one, um, and I'll try to be real quick. I got put into the psychiatric system as a teenager. I was an only girl with five brothers, three stepbrothers, and sexually abused by them. And so when I told a psychiatrist in the hospital, I was being sexually abused. I weighed like 70 pounds. I was very anorexic. He said I wasn't anorexic. He told my parents I was schizophrenic and was hallucinating my abuse. My father, I came from a political family. My father tried to, was worried about my brothers, one of my brother's political careers. He is famous now, so he's doing fine. So my father tried to have me committed and put under conservatorship, like Britney mm -hmm. Spears. Fortunately, my dad died. And I, I beat that, but it's been hard for me to get out of a system that keeps, that keeps me trapped. I, I did escape the system once. I know I had a, part of my abuse involved cops. Um, growing up and so I was in a car wreck and when the cops came I had a flashback of, of them beating me up and so I got put back in the psychiatric system I had a psychiatrist who just grossly over medicated me long story short anytime I would disagree with her she would call the cops and put me in the hospital the only way I was able to escape her was she lost her license. Wow. Then I went, went off most of the drugs cold turkey, but ended up having to have heart surgery, constantly having to get my lungs, lugs, lug, lungs drained, um, blood transfusions. They were testing me for AIDS. But um, I did stay on 200 milligrams of Seroquel and Alprazolam. I'm off the Alprazolam. I'm down to about six milligrams of the Seroquel. I did all of this completely on my own. I did not know there was even a community out there. I thought I was the only one who's been raped by a psychiatrist 
who's been mistreated by a psychiatrist. And, and, uh, and it's, it's been six psychiatrists I've had and they've lost their licenses. Wow. And um, so even like a year ago or so, I was put in the hospital, a uh, medical hospital, and the doctors just took it upon themselves to put me on respital and Cyprexa. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and so I live in fear of, of that happening to me in the future. And, and how do I shed myself of this label? And, and the reason I got into the community was I was going to keep all of this a secret and take it to my grave. I wasn't yeah. going to tell about being raped and, and abused on psych units right here in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. um, but then I kept checking up on my former psychiatrist because I knew that after she lost her license, she went to the state of Illinois, but then she almost immediately lost it there. So I was like, okay, I'm fine. But then I would check up on her periodically. So right around, uh, right before the pandemic ended, started, I checked on her again. She had gotten her license like six months prior but then three months after getting her license reinstated, she was put on probation. She's still in practice. So I, I while I'm trying, getting off this last bit of Seroquel is killing me. Yeah. It's killing me and I'm doing it liquid, but I'm, I'm feeling all that rage and anger at all the abuse I endured in the system. I didn't find any compassion I, I, I can't find any compassion for psychiatrists. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm being on. No, but I'm a understand. survivor. I mean, I, I have finally realized I am stronger than any therapist I could ever see. Because oh, yeah. I not only survived eight brothers sexually abusing me, I survived cops. I survived psychiatrists at Mercy Hospital in 1980, abusing me. So there's no therapist that has any right to sit in judgment. And has, the only therapist, the person I would sit in a room with would be Angie. Oh, thank you, Andrea. Oh, Keep fighting, keep fighting. I see you on Twitter and around. So keep doing what you're doing. Stay and strong. I just think it's wrong when, when a woman or anybody presents themselves with trauma, the first thing they do is drug, especially when you've been raped. Yeah, it's terrible. So sorry, I hope I didn't. Uh, you're fine. You're totally fine. Or anybody, I don't. I try not totally to. Totally fine. But I think I think we'll we'll start to wrap up. Does anybody have any closing thoughts? Anybody in the audience? Burning desires, as they say in twelve step groups. <laughs> Anything burning? Can I just do, I just did yeah. on a super quick one in response sure. to her. I tried to type it and I ended up sending it to someone else. That's Please okay. know you're not alone, Andrea, and everyone else. Please know you're not alone. We may all have variations in our stories, but there are so many things you shared that I share with you. Um, yeah. And I think a lot of us think it's just us. There are so many of us out here. Please know that. True. Lauren. I'm going to get my thing here. Uh, sorry. Um, so just, I know I have, I have a doctor who is absolutely amazing. Um, who is letting me taper the way that I want to. Um, but I know, I know <laughs> I was on four at one time, nothing like what you had, but, um, how, what is the best way or what do you, what do you think is the best thing that we can do for those that don't have those kind of doctors? Like, I know that's kind of, I feel like that's kind of where you're wanting to go and who you're kind of like trying to reach as well. Um, yeah. But that, I mean, that's the biggest struggle I feel like is for those that want to do it the right way that can't. That's a really good question. Because um, when I was in, uh, when I did this, I did a fellowship. I forgot to talk about all this stuff, but oh, well, who cares? When I was, I did a fellowship for VFW where I was trying to do like major systems change within the VA to like force the VA to 
they have a whole division within VA that does research. And that's very unique because private hospitals don't do that. So it's like if we could get first, then it would trickle down to the civilian community. That was my vision. Okay. But when I saw how hard it is to change a system, I was like, it's not going to happen. Like systems are built to stay status quo. They're not designed to change. And even if there is change, it's incremental change. You can see it in Congress. Like they won't outlaw guns. I mean, just, you know, everything is just a little bit left or right. Um, it's never like major systemic change. That's kind of where I shifted to. It's got to be one doctor at a time, one patient at a time. It's not going to be, you know, hold on. I think I, I think my internet skipped. Okay. I'm back. All right. Um, it's not, it's going to be one patient at a time, one doctor at a time. So what I do is I tell patients to just ask your doctor a question. The question is, what do you know about antidepressant withdrawal? Or what do you know about benzo withdrawal? Or what has your training been in getting people off psych drug? Or for instance, if I am taking Lexapro and I went off of it, what could I expect? And then don't say anything. Don't tell them what you Google. Don't tell them about our community. Don't tell them what you found about the Ashton manual or tapering. Just let them answer the question. And how they answer the question is going to tell you everything you need to know. If they say you can get off slowly, it's going to take time. It might take you a year to heal. You've been on it for 30 years. You know, if they're educated, you can tell pretty quickly. If they tell you like you can be off in two weeks and you'll be fine, no effects, it'll be out of your body, run or just don't say it. So what I notice is most people do not have doctors they can cooperate with. There is a few select doctors that I can refer to um, that, you know, I've scanned through the years and I've, I mean, I've even talked to psychiatrists on the phone and, and drilled them for an hour and a half and I could hear their voice shaking because they know I know what I'm talking about, you know? And I'm like, I'm not sending you anybody unless I know what you're doing to them, you know? And if they answer it the wrong way, I'm not sending you anybody. There's no, no way, because I know how severe this can be. So um, there's very few doctors out there right now, but so it really is in the patient's hands is what I'll say. And it's hard for me to say this out loud, but it's like most patients have to taper at home quietly. They keep getting the drug prescribed to them. They figure out how to do it. They take control of their own taper and that's how they get off. That's what most of us are doing. That is like revolutionary because the power is in the patient's hands. You know what I mean? It's really sad that the medical establishment has left the building and here we are on our own, but what are we going to do? It's the only way until the, the systemic change happens, which I don't see anytime soon. I've seen a little bit of change over the years, but not much, not like deprescribing at the APA conference. That's not a class. There's no CNE credit for deprescribing that I know of. Maybe I'm wrong, but I haven't seen it, <sighs> but that's it. Anybody else? Last chance. And then I'll say some closing thoughts. Last chance. Yeah, Lynn, go ahead. You have to unmute. Here we go. Wait, unmute yourself. Angie, there. Perfect. I just um hi everyone. I'm Lynn. Um with medicating normal. And I just want to say I think our since we started researching for the film in 2016, I have noted Angie's right about the medical system. They are very slow, but the media, what you can find now in the media is very different than what we you could find before 2015 wow. and i attribute this to angie and to her fellow subjects in the film who are brave enough and to you guys here today who are really brave enough to actually speak your stories with detail with um integrity and um that is what is going to change um that is absolutely in my opinion and and angie's right it is one telling it at, to one doctor at a time getting a doctor asking those right questions saying hey have you read this book give them anatomy of an epidemic or any of the other great books we know about um but again i'm just going back angie thank you for your courage you are amazing and um you have created a movement in speaking your story thank, thank you. you so much thank you and then in closing, just thank you all for coming. Like, thank you to everybody who gave me an encouraging word while I was trying to heal and get through this. Thank you to all the admins that I know in the, gr in the groups that help people every single day. Um, I know Lauren Archie Lexapro. And then there's some Benzo, um, Benzo Warrior Group people here in inner, inner Fire in Vermont. Kim Oliver at the, oh, what is it called? I have the book up here. Kim, what's it called? talking to you, Kim Oliver. What is it? The what? Choice theory. Uh, 
I can't think of his name. Sorry, though. Glasser, William Glasser. Glasser, William Glasser. I went to their I went to their conference when I was in withdrawal to meet Peter Bregan and Bob Whitaker in person. And Peter Bregan said, Angie, keep your mouth shut while you're in social work school. If you want to say something that's critical of psychiatry, you imagine Dr. Bregan sitting on your shoulder telling you to shut up and hold it until you graduate. <laughs> so that that was very helpful. So thank you, everybody. The best, the best thing. I just want to be helpful to our community. So if you know anybody that needs coaching, send them my way. My website is angiepeacock.com, not Angela Peacock. That's Coldwell Banker, some lady in New Jersey. It's angiepeacock.com. <laughs> um, if you want me to come to your community and do a workshop or speak to your organization or any, do a conference, I'll submit a proposal, whatever you want. I'm here. This is my passion. I just want to see people get through. I want change to be made. That's just, I live, eat, and breathe this stuff. And then I exercise and eat tacos to balance the whole thing. So, <laughs> so thank you for coming so much. I just, I love spending time with you guys and we should do this again sometime and just Thanks, love you. Man. thank you. Bye-bye. And every, all the links are in the comments. You'll get, I'll send links out or something after this, but angiepeacock.com. Thank you guys. Bye. Thank you, Angie. Bye.